I'm not going to go very long, but I did have something on my heart that I wanted to share with you tonight, and it's something God has been speaking to me about and encouraging me with this thought, and that is to be a riser. Amen? What does it mean to be a riser? God is in the raising business, right? I just want to let you know that it is a privilege to be a woman in the kingdom of God in this day and age. Would you agree? These are exciting thrilling, frightening, unpredictable times that we live in, but what a privilege to be a woman serving in the kingdom of God in this day and age. You know, women are awesome. We have some built-in things that men don't really have, but women do. We are resourceful. We can make something out of nothing. I'll just spit. I'm sorry. We can make something out of nothing. Have you ever had an empty pantry? Okay, I've got Pop-Tarts, I've got rice, and I've got hot dogs. (laughs) What am I going to do? And your kids would swear up and down that you made the best meal. We are resourceful. We are creative. Kid needs a a costume for a Christmas program. You're going to get very resourceful and creative. We are multitaskers to the max, right? I'm sure everyone in here can do more than one thing at once. Also, we are intuitive. It's like we have a sixth sense and... We are perceptive. We can absorb things that are going on around us. We're resilient. God has made us in such a way that we can encounter difficulty and hardship, and we can bounce back. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever watched a friend walk through something? You're like, how in the world are they getting through that? I can guarantee they have a relationship with the Lord, but also God has just built in women a resilience to get through tough times. Amen? And I believe women are superhuman, and men not so much. So I think you saw a picture of a toilet paper roll, and it said, if during my trial they ask you why I finally snapped. I'm sure if you have a husband, a son, a nephew, a grandson, you have seen this happen. That is not very resourceful. Would you agree? (laughs) That is not using your mind to its full capacity. A lot of guys, you know, they just give kind of minimum effort, there's no doubt. My husband is a hard worker, but when we boil it down, they're just going to get by with the bare necessities. Would you agree? It's just the way they are. God made them that way. They're very sensory perceptive, so if they can't taste it, touch it, smell it, feel it, it's not really real to them yet, right? That's why we can win them with our cooking. They're also more like single tasker people. My husband can't do two things at once at all. He thinks he can, and I try to help him, and I try to help him unravel that thinking process, but men are different. But listen, women, we have been given, I believe, and what God has been talking to me about is the ability to rise to the occasion, that in all of our lives, there are things that come up that God has put on the inside of us, the ability to encounter a situation and rise to the occasion. Amen? We are wired on the inside to get the job done. Women are, women are great doers. We see a, a man sees a problem and he wants to fix it. A woman wants to think about it and think about it and think about it and come up with the best plan, plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. We are those people. Uh, If we need to get three kids to three different practices in three different places across town in 30 minutes, we get the job done. We rise to the occasion. We look back and think, how did I get that done? I have no idea, but I got it done. We make ends meet. Have you ever had too much month at the end of a paycheck, and you've got to feed people on $25 that's supposed to last about eight days? Women can do it. Women know how to rise to the occasion. We know how to make ends meet. We can see an impossible task all the way through to the end and, like I said, look back and wonder how. I believe that is a God-given ability and that we should not overlook that. It's how he made us. But often, emotion will get involved in our thinking processes and it will begin to mess with us. Our hormones will begin to mess with us and cause us to think differently about ourselves than we really are. Has anyone ever set up Camp Grumpy at home? (laughs) You are running Camp Grumpy. I have done it time and time again where I just let my emotions 
get the better of me. I let my fatigue get on top of me, and I'm not necessarily rising to the occasion anymore. And I'm missing opportunities. Have you ever set up a tent in the cul-de-sac of exhaustion? You know what a cul-de-sac is. What do you do? (laughs) You go round and round and round. Have you ever been so exhausted that you just think, I'm too tired to even think about how exhausted I am, and I just can't seem to get ahead of the game? I have had that thought so many times. I just can't seem to get ahead. I feel like I'm always playing catch up with all these different lists of things to do and people to take care of and places to be and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Has anyone else been there? It's very tiring to go around and around that cul-de-sac. Also, the valley of failure. Have you ever built a house in the valley of failure? Or the valley of disappointed, disappointment, I'm sorry. The valley of unmet expectations, broken dreams, things that haven't come to pass that you thought for sure God told you that. That's a valley, and you know what? If we're not careful, we will build a house there. We don't mean to. You know, a friend said one time, if you're going through hell, keep on going. Don't stop. (laughs) If you're going through it, keep on going. Keep walking and get to the other side. But I think as women, the enemy is out to slow us down and cause us to get caught up in emotion and in disappointment and disillusionment. And we can do that. We can build a house uh, in the valley of disappointment. But I want you to know this. Really, all we want when we're tired is we want someone to come up to us and say, and I think there's a slide, sometimes I just want someone to hug me and say, I know it's hard. You're going to be okay. Here's coffee and $5 million. (laughs) Wouldn't that make you feel good? (laughs) Some days are just like that. It doesn't matter what season of life you're in. If you're in high school, if you're a mom with little babies running around all over the place, if you've got kids in upper school, if your kids are out of the house, if you never had kids, we have times in life where really all we want someone to do is just say, it's going to be okay. Here's $5 million. (laughs) That would be so great. But I will say this, I really believe, and I've seen it time and time again, that I don't believe, I know the enemy is out to steal, kill, and destroy, absolutely. But I do believe in women's lives, and especially women that are trying to be a light in their family and lead those around them just with the love of Christ and their abilities in the home and at work and with friends and family. I believe the enemy would rather distract us than really take us out. Because if he can distract us and cause us to go round and round and round and kind of keep us exhausted and keep us on that little hamster wheel, to him that's a lot better than taking you out because it just keeps you under his thumb. But that is not God's will for us. Amen? The enemy wants to keep us in a cycle of disappointment and disillusion so that we're not a threat. We're not even a godly threat to our family. We're just too tired. We're not a godly threat in our workplace. We're just too tired. We clock in, we clock out, we get our job done, and we begin to forget that God has wired us to rise to every occasion. It is a God-given wiring on the inside of us. So it's time to recognize his schemes and rise to every occasion. I want to tell you what it means to rise to the occasion. I have a definition slide. The first definition of rise to the occasion is to do what is needed at the time. Pretty basic. If you're going to rise to the occasion, if you have a wedding to go to, you're going to find a dress. And you're going to rise to the occasion. You're going to dress what fits the part for that wedding. The second definition of rise to the occasion is to succeed in dealing with a difficult situation. So not only doing what's needed, but dealing with it. To me, that means you're problem solving and you're doing a little bit more than just showing up. And the final definition of rise to the occasion is to show unexpected skill. I love that, in dealing with difficulty or unexpected challenge. You know, we all experience curveballs, things that happen very suddenly, very unexpected, things that are unfair, uh, things that we thought were going to go one way, but it ended up going a different way. Uh, Those are just the curveballs of life, and they can be very disheartening. They can knock the wind out of us. They can disorient us where we can't get our bearings of what's up and down and left and right. But 
being able to rise to the occasion, which I know that we each can do, is to show an unexpected skill for an unexpected challenge. That, to me, says that God has wired us in a way that we have what it takes on the inside to face anything. Amen? We have more than enough. And really, it's not just a female thing, but we're talking girl talk tonight. And so I know that as women of God, he wants us to be encouraged tonight. That it doesn't matter what we're facing or, you know, what is ahead for us. There are curveballs coming that we cannot predict. There are things in our nation we cannot predict. Things in our city, things in our workplace, uh, things with loved ones, with children, with parents that we cannot predict. But God has already gone ahead of us. He's already wired us so that when we encounter that, we have an unexpected skill to deal with it. Amen? It's his strength. So let me tell you what it's not. Because sometimes when I, when I think about this idea of rising to the occasion, I'm like, okay, I must have to like really just, if I'm exhausted and, and I'm running at Mach 10 and, I, and I'm not getting everything done I should and I feel really bad about it, but okay, I'm supposed to rise to the occasion, so I'm just going to get myself together and I'm going to get my act together. That is not what rising to the occasion is. It's not mustering your own strength and pulling yourself up alone. That's not what it is. It's not about doing better or trying harder because God says don't strive. You know, we're called human beings for a reason. We are not human doings. We are human beings. He really just wants us to be, just to be, because he created us just to be, not to do. We have things to do, but we don't have to do just to, be, to please him or to rise to the occasion. It's not about wearing yourself out or striving to be perfect. And, you know, I think women have struggled with this, I think, from just the, the dawn of time. And that is just comparing ourselves to one another. And what a trap. We've all done it. I do it. It sounds easier to not do it than it actually is because it's just something in the way our minds are made that we are constantly measuring ourselves. You know, and I know, we've all met or watched or seen that lady who just has it all together. And you think to yourself, how does she do it? How does she do it? And you, you don't realize it, but we're measuring ourselves against that. And God says we are not wise when we compare ourselves to one another. So rising to the occasion doesn't mean looking at someone else and saying, well, they have it together. I'm going to do what they're doing, whatever they're doing. Whatever they're eating, whatever vitamins they're taking, I'm going to do that. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean that we compare ourselves to one another. She does not have it all together. And you know what? There is a slide that makes me laugh out loud every time I see it. I am not interested in competing with anyone. I hope we all make it. <laughs> you know, we are all in our own battles. We are all facing circumstances, whether they're public or not. And when you see another lady that you think might have it together or have one up on you, I guarantee you she's struggling with something. And I guarantee you she still cries over someone and still hurts over things and still has disappointments. And in her room alone at night, she's thinking someone else has it all together. So it's a vicious cycle. And I, I know God cautions me all the time, just be, just be you and be in your journey and mind your business and don't compare because gosh I hope we all make it <laughs> and we will so how do we rise I believe that we first and foremost allow God to infuse us with strength to get the job done there are just things that happen in a moment unexpected that we just we just have to jump into gear we were doing one thing you've done it you have to just do something else Maybe it's as simple as the dinner that you prepared burns. <laughs> you have to get into gear and you have to make a plan B pretty quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. We also rise up higher by going deeper. Deeper, deeper, deeper. And there's a picture of a sunflower. It's one of my favorite pictures. This is actually a photograph a friend of mine took in North Carolina. The sunflower to me is so, it's resilient because, you know, you have to think about it. 
anything that grows starts as a seed, and the sunflower especially starts so small but grows so fast, and that stalk can get so thick, and that head can get so heavy, but it's always standing up, and it's always looking for the sun. And I love that because as a riser, we have to go deep in order to be lifted up. You know, a glorious bloom must first be buried and then push up against the dirt in order to reach the sunlight. Have you ever felt buried? <laughs> I have. You can't see the light. You feel like you can't breathe. You can't even turn your head left or right. Uh, I know that, you know, Chris and I in ministry, we walked through a time where we were doubting if we would ever dig out. Uh, just some hurtful things had happened in our experience, and we felt literally buried, like we didn't know what to do. We, we couldn't breathe. We were so surrounded by this issue that it just seemed like we would never get out of it. And I remember the Holy Spirit just encouraging me one time when I was just just crying because I just was like, what are we going to do? I felt like we were so disqualified and that ministry for us was just over. It probably was not going to be in our future because there were just no other options. We were just buried under pain and misunderstanding, and, and it was very, very painful. It was very personal. But I remember the Holy Spirit said, you can't see out of this right now, but I promise one day, you will look back, and you're going to be on the other side of it. Sometimes the pain is so great that you feel like you can't breathe, but I can promise you that if you will just look to God, one day you will be able to look back and say, gosh, remember that? Remember when? Does anyone have a remember when story? Remember when? Isn't that awesome? When we look at other ladies and we're like, how do they get through that? Well, I just want to encourage you that we're all going to face curveballs and trials, and we're all going to get buried and feel buried at some point. But watch what God can do with buried things. Think about that. Because the Bible says a seed cannot grow out of the ground and produce anything until it dies. A seed literally dies in the dirt, passes away, and then life happens. Isn't that amazing? That just amazes me. So God can do a lot with dead and buried things. And maybe you feel that way. Maybe there's a promise that you feel like God gave you at some time in your life. Maybe about a child. Maybe about a job. Uh, maybe about a ministry. And you're like, when in the world is this going to happen? He said it. Isn't it supposed to happen? But that thing has to be buried and it has to die before it can bring forth life and before it can push up through the dirt and, and get out and catch its breath and catch the sun. So be encouraged. If you have buried things, let it die. I have things that are still buried. And I promise, let God water that thing and work on that thing in the dirt and it will come back. Amen? There is a great contentment and satisfaction that comes with acknowledging the season of life you're in. I love and I feel like God has always talked to me about seasons and about plants and trees and stuff. Maybe that's just the way I'm wired. But everyone goes through seasons in life. And if we can get God's perspective and acknowledge what season you're in, you will feel a lot better about moving forward. Have you ever been in a personal winter and you're fighting it? I don't want to be in winter anymore. I want it to be spring. <laughs> I want to thaw out. And I want God to do a new thing in my life. Everyone goes through a winter. Everyone goes through a spring, et cetera, et cetera. And when we can take an honest look and say, okay, I am where I am. God is going to cause the seasons to change in its due time. A great contentment will come over you. It, not that it won't be hard, but God will just continue to move you through that season. And it's in winter. You know, when we lived in Asheville in the mountains. I don't know if you guys have winter crocus here, but in the mountains, my favorite part of the year was when there was still snow on the ground, but that little crocus would come up through that snow, those green leaves in that beautiful purple or yellow bulb, just like in the middle of ice, it seemed like. And it 
Who knew what it was doing under there all that time, right? Our lives are like that. I promise that even if you're in a winter, and I have been in many winters, and I'm, I know many of you out there have been in many more than me, just hang on and let that dirt do its work and let it hibernate. If you're in winter or something else, don't compare your season to someone else's spring. You know, it's easy again to compare and to look elsewhere and think, you know, have you ever been in worship and you feel like you're just not, you're just not in it? Can't feel it, can't sense God's presence. It feels like there's a, a brass ceiling over your head. Your prayers are boomerang prayers, like my husband would say. You toss them up and they just come back and land in your lap. Don't look to the person to your right or left and see them just in the glory cloud, weeping and just enjoying God's presence. Don't compare yourself to that because they may be in summer or spring. Everyone is in a different place. But I tell you what, we're called to be risers. So how do I rise? We call on God and we be honest. We allow pruning. Pruning is difficult, but it's necessary. Have you ever had something that you thought was fruitful and positive in your life, and God's like, I think I'm just going to cut that off. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. Aren't you supposed to prune dead things? Yes, but if any of you know, like the first time, I didn't grow up around trees in Texas, but when we moved to the south, I was like, there are such things as trees that are taller than me. Someone came to our house to prune, before, you know, late fall headed into winter, and they just butchered this tree. I mean, like it was a dogwood, a beautiful spring dogwood. And they just cut it down. I cried and I said, what have you done? You killed it. He said, just wait and watch. Have you ever seen a tree that's been pruned back hard, a hard pruning? That thing busts out in the spring. And it is gorgeous. And it's bigger and it's better and it's even more lovely to behold. It gets taller. It gets wider. And you know what's interesting about pruning? Because I have over pruned my bushes before. It's kind of sad. But when you prune deep and hard, that tree will respond with greater growth in that spot. So if there's a spot or an area in your life where you feel like God has, has cut it back, even when it was going okay, it was going good, it felt like it was producing fruit, be encouraged because he is prepping you for some massive growth in that area. Amen? So we call on God. We're honest. We allow him to prune dead things. We work on our own root system. We have to take some ownership. That means getting God time into your life. Get into the word. Spend some time in personal worship. Get some books that are really good. And come to church. <laughs> Church, you know, a lot of times when we're, when we're grieving in a certain area of our life, we want to just stay home, really. It's just easier. You're not in the mood. But let me encourage you. This is the place to be. This is where it's happening. And this is where you're going to have people who are warm and loving get around you in all different seasons of life and cheer you on that you're going to make it. You're going to look back and see this on the other side. Another important thing is to have a support system, even outside of church or church girlfriends. It is very important to have some good girlfriends, right? We need good girlfriends, somebody that can make a casserole if you need one, someone that can, you know, bail you out <laughs> if you need help. Everyone needs a friend like that where you can, at the drop of a hat, call on them and say, I need help. And you can get really real and you can get really ugly you know, the best friends are the ones that see us at the ugliest, and they still love us, and they still walk with us, and they're there on the other side. And then you look back together, and you say, wow, look what the Lord has done. And then this one is something that I think women, we are so guilty of overlooking, and that is feeding your soul. Your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions need to be fed. If there's something that you enjoy... Painting, pottery, gardening, reading, spending time with your grandchildren, whatever it might be. Things that feed your soul. You just feel good after you do it. It's enjoyable. Maybe it's baking. Maybe it's visiting someone in a nursing home. It could be anything. Whatever feeds your soul. There is a tank on the inside of us. And if we just go, 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 or if we winter and don't feed our soul, we will go bankrupt. 
on the inside. Maybe it's just getting in your, for me, <laughs> it's getting in my car and just going for a drive. I love to just get out and drive and see things. And to me, I come back and I feel refreshed. I feel like my soul has been ministered to and just kind of filled back up. And it's just like a, whew. Does anybody else do that? Anybody else drive around? <laughs> Maybe it's just me. Find something that you love to do. He restores my soul. He leads me beside still waters, and he restores my soul. If, it, if it's restored, it means it goes empty and it has to be refilled. So don't be afraid to do something for yourself. I guess that's my point. And as busy moms or wives or working full-time maybe, we can really begin to neglect things that we need to do that will minister to our soul. Some people have said that's not godly, but I believe it's very godly because he restores my soul. So fill up that tank. And one of the last thoughts is in order to rise, how do I rise? You walk out of the valley. Again, don't build your house in that valley. Don't stay there. Your good girlfriends are going to come dig you out. <laughs> They're going to say, come on, you can't stay here. And so, you know, maybe you're not the one wintering. Maybe you are doing awesome, and you're just in a really awesome season of life and, and uh, really enjoying it. Be sensitive to those around you that might feel buried right now. And be that girlfriend that says, come on, I'm getting you out of here. I'm busting you out. <laughs> We're going to walk together out of this valley. You have to keep on going. So how do I rise? There's another slide, lifting others. We rise by lifting others. We so need each other. First look up, then look around. Your first gaze is on God himself, your Savior. And then look around. He's going to tell you to look around anyway. And find someone that you can lift. If you feel low, lift someone else up. And I promise you'll be lifted in the process. Amen? Encourage someone, pray for someone, serve someone. There are so many opportunities to get out of our little thing, <laughs> our little world, and, and get out and serve and bless someone. I'm going to ask Allison to come up here with her guitar real quick. She's going to close us out in a song, um, and we're just going to have a worshipful moment at the end. But I want you to feel encouraged that you are a riser. Look at your neighbor and say, you were made for this. You were made for this. It doesn't matter what you're facing. You were made for this. You've got the goods. God hardwired us to be able to rise to the occasion. And it is only his strength. It is nothing in ourself that we can accomplish anything. If you're a good mom and you can multitask, that is the Lord. If you're excellent in the office... And people sing your praises, that is the Lord. Amen. It doesn't matter what we can do. If you can get through Walmart in 20 minutes and 100 bucks, that is the Lord. <laughs> that is the Lord. You were made for this. God has really been encouraging me in this, that women are highly adaptable. If you start to get stiff in life and not malleable anymore, you're missing out on something from the Holy Spirit. He wants to keep us soft. He wants to keep us adaptable. A woman can change on a dime. Her mind, yes, she can change her mind on a dime. But when we're confronted with something, especially suddenly, we have the God-given ability in us to just change gears and adapt. Adaptability is often overlooked, but it is a huge worth to us. Because we can adapt to anything. I'm adapting to the winter that's coming. It's all mental right now. <laughs> and y'all, it was gorgeous today. It was chilly, but it was still a beautiful day. And I'm rejoicing every day that that winter is delayed, that harsh winter. <laughs> You're laughing because you know it's coming. I know it's coming. Got me a good coat. Well... I want to remind you, he has built it into you, the ability to rise to any occasion and get through it. It's not easy all the time. It's not like we can just snap to it and, oh, that was easy. 
you know, life is hard work and we need each other. It's not about trying harder or making up your mind, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better, I'm going to do better. I used to do that. Just be and just respond to the Lord. He does the work. He just shows you how to do it and how to do it from a place of rest. You know, we strive and we strive and we strive and we contemplate and we run things into the ground in our mind. And it's exhausting. Anybody else get exhausted from just thinking about things? <laughs> Women are great overanalyzers. That's not what God has for us. It's not about trying harder or striving. It's about grow, uh, gr drawing closer to Him and growing deeper. I want to close with a scripture because this is scripturally founded. Our scripture comes from Psalm 4610, and this is the New English translation. And I like this translation for this reason. Stop your striving and recognize that I am God. I will be exalted over the nations and I will be exalted over the earth. Most translations say be still and know that I am God. I think we get used to that scripture. We don't think about it. I loved this translation. Stop your striving and just recognize that I'm God. He's the one that makes the sun come up, the moon go around. And the seasons change. So stop striving. Just take a deep breath and relax. Stop striving and simply rise. Amen? We are risers. We can rise to any occasion. I just want to pray for you quickly, and then Allison's just going to lead us in a simple worship chorus that I hope will touch your heart. But just be encouraged tonight. I appreciate you letting me share my heart. I feel like I've rambled on and on, but... I hope that you're encouraged and that when those curveballs come, or no matter where you are today, that it's inside of you and we can rise to the occasion. Amen. Father, I thank you so much for these beautiful ladies, your daughters. I thank you for bringing us together tonight and just ministering to us through song, through your word, through good food, through laughter and fellowship. We thank you for the Christmas season. And Father, I, I thank you that um, you truly have equipped us with everything that we need in every season to face everything and get on to the other side of it. So Father, I pray special encouragement over anyone tonight that feels buried or feels like they're suffocating or feels like they can't see on the other side. I pray that you would just breathe fresh air into them and encouragement that they would feel lifted tonight, that they would feel encouraged that this is just a point in the timeline of life. I thank you that your perspective is higher. You see our lives stretched out like a long timeline. And just help us remember that we shouldn't get bogged down in what's happening today. That we should just look up and then look around. We bless you, God, and we thank you in Jesus' name.